and not only as, as an educator, but, um, but as a dad. You know, I think it's important, we, you know, both are one and the same. So we serve our children um, and we serve our students the, the way they deserve to be served. So thank you for your service. I want to take a quick moment to share with you a, a couple of things. One, what we're looking at doing um, in regards to the governor's proposed budget. And as you know, and you may have heard on, on television, the governor is taking a really aggressive approach in education funding. So there's two things that are happening at the same time. One, we have a committee of legislatures that are working really hard, doing some great work to create a basic education funding formula. And some of the things they want to take into account as part of this funding formula is to make sure they look at you know, the poverty factor within communities, to take a look at the specific needs of, of dispersed, you know, dispersed poverty or condensed poverty. So as we serve urban districts and as we serve rural districts, looking at the specific needs of English language learners, tying in the work that's already been done for special education students, looking at specifically how we fund school districts on a per pupil basis to ensure that the funding for school districts is equitable and not necessarily equal as you hear because we know that dollar for dollar isn't the same as providing the resources that individual communities need and students across different communities deserve. But the governor has looked at this basic education work and has said, you know what, this is really good work. But if you have a formula built on a, a you know, very shaky foundation, you know, we know, we know what happens, and, and the formula or anything you build on a shaky foundation falls apart. So he's done something very specific with this budget. He said, I want to present a budget, I want to propose a budget that is going to provide a solid foundation for the work of the Basic Education Funding uh, Commission. And what he did in doing that was propose a $1 billion investment in education from, from pre-K through higher ed. He's also said this is the first of the first one billion he's looking to invest. Ultimately, the governor has a plan to invest two billion dollars in pre-K through higher ed. And I'm going to share some specifics with you just so you can kind of get an idea of what we're looking at across the state, but then we'll get some specifics around how that will impact Philadelphia in itself. First, for our younger kids, for our youngest students, our three and four year olds in our pre-K programs, our Head Start programs, we're looking at investing $120 million to, to um, expand our early childhood offering. And this is just the first year of, four, of a four year investment. We're looking to make an investment of at least $100 million each year for the next few years. Now, what, so what does that mean? What are the numbers? So if you're looking at a $120 million investment in early childhood, that will create 14,000 additional slots for children across the Commonwealth. So we're looking at providing early childhood education opportunities for 14,000 more kids. We've asked for school districts across the state to start to apply or put in for interest towards those funds, and Philadelphia put in a significant uh, you know, amount of interest, some, some real aggressive applications going forward. So we're looking, you know, we're looking very, very good going into the the, um, the negotiations for you know for this funding. Although we have 14,000 slots, there's actually been interest for a little over 20,000 slots across the state of Pennsylvania. You know, our, our goal is that we can provide a quality early childhood program for most of our children across the Commonwealth. They're going, to, they're going to start kindergarten prepared to learn, which is then going to have a positive impact do, during those formative years when you're learning to read, and then move into those third grade and beyond years where you're reading to learn. And understanding that you can't read to learn if you've not learned to read. So the investment in early childhood is going to do exactly that. Better prepare our students to enter a school ready to learn, ready to read. Secondly, when we're looking at um, K-12, to some significant investments in K-12. to We've been asking school districts across the Commonwealth, uh, you know, of course, it, you know, Philadelphia being one of them, if you get the proposed budget, which for Philly is a little over $100 million, it's a little over an additional $100 million, what are you going to use that funding for? First, most school districts across the state said we want to invest more money in resources, and um, you know resources in classrooms, 
uh, professional development and <coughs> updated curriculum. Second, wanted to invest in early childhood opportunities, kindergarten, you know, expanding full day kindergarten options. And last, looking to make up for some of the reductions that have been made over the course of the past few years. So school districts have spoken very, very deliberately, very plainly, and said these are the three areas we want to invest in. And the governor has, has really made a commitment to trying to put those resources in place so that we can invest in those, in those specific areas. So in addition to that K-12 investment, we're looking at middle and high school, uh, creating an eight, uh, investing $8 million, it is, uh, for middle and high school counselors geared provide, that will provide college and career counseling for students looking, you know, really preparing themselves to engage in life after high school. We're looking at investing $9 million in what we call dual enrollment so that high school students can take college courses while completing high school nice. so they can get their start on, col on college opportunities. We're looking at investing significantly in our career and technical education programs at a, different level, at a few different levels. First, providing technology grants or equipment grants so that our career and technical education centers can update their, their labs to better mirror what we're using in industry. Providing a significant amount of money, 40 plus million dollars for grants for career and technical education centers to, to create labs in industry recognized areas. One of the areas we're also, one of the things we're looking to do across the state is even creating some of our, some new schools around uh, what we're calling our, our P-TECH model type schools that are aligned to industry standards, but also looking at a 2-2-2 model where you're completing high school, you're working on college credits, and have a real pathway to gainful employment after graduation. So we really want to be sure that we're preparing students before they enter school, we're preparing students and investing in students from K to 12, but we're not stopping there. When you take a look at what we're looking to do for um, higher education, you know, the governor has asked, he's, he's, he's invested significantly in our state colleges and state-related colleges, community colleges, technical colleges, and universities. And he said, you know what, we have to make sure college is affordable for our students graduating from high school. So he's asked that they hold the line and not increase tuition, make, allow us to work with our families to send our kids to two-year, four-year institutions, to technical institutions that are going to help them improve their quality of life. He's ensured that they, we invest in the higher ed institutions so that they will continue to invest in our children. Another couple areas that we're really looking up to significantly make an investment in is that career you can continue to hear, especially from the governor, around career and technical education opportunities. Because we understand at the end of the day, we're responsible for doing four things for our high school graduates. One, we have to make sure they're prepared to enter the workforce, you know, to enter the military, they're successful in, in that pathway if that's what they choose to do. We have to be sure that they're prepared to go into an industry certified uh, program, something that's going to give them a piece of paper in their hand that ensures they're in a high skilled uh, they have a high school occupation that they're going to go on to be successful. We have to prepare them to receive a two-year degree. We have to prepare them to receive a four-year degree. So if we're looking at those four pathways towards success, all of our programs from high school, middle, and elementary school have to be aligned to that end. And some of that, when you're just looking at what the governor is looking at, at investing in, you know, this $1 billion will provide the resources. What we have to do as a department is put the systems in place to maximize those resources. So some of what we're looking at now is how we update our school performance profile. So we're working with the legislature on the school performance profile to really you know, understand that if at the end of the day our goal is to fulfill those four obligations for every student across the Commonwealth, then how do we create a system of measurement that drives those programs? Because one of the things that we know is what you measure gets done and if your sole measurement is a standardized test, then you're really not asking anything to get done in our schools. Yes, yes, yes. And you know, you're gonna hear the governor sharing a lot more of this as we move forward. It's understanding measurement has to drive programming and programming has to be focused on what's best for kids. And you know, at the end of the day, is if that's what we want, that's what we measure, and that's what becomes part of our accountability system. And we're not looking at watering down accountability. We're just looking at measuring the right things. 
And it's also something that we're working around the Keystone exams. I know that's been a hot topic for everyone as we've been talking, you know, today. And, and that is a big conversation for us at the department, along with the legislature and the governor and his team, to see how we can create a better indicator that will align to graduation requirements that shows the students have participated in some multiple pathway to graduation. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about that um, as, as we move forward. We just have to get agreement around the specifics in those areas. But everyone is in agreement. And when I say everyone, the Department of Education, the Senate, the House members, uh, you know, the Education Senate, the Education House, the Governor's Office, everyone is in agreement that we have to do something. And now we're working towards the detail on that. And hopefully we'll have something very, very soon uh, to report back to you. Um, and probably our, the, the last area in, in terms of a department, and this is really big, uh, you know, kind of reflects on what we're doing today, is being visible. You know, we, we've been trying to spend as much time in our communities as we can because we understand the Department of Education is your department. Two billion dollars. She said, it says here that you're going to have two billion dollars toward education. Where is that money going to come from? When a, a governor or a governor's office department proposes a budget, it's a real menu type of budget and folks pull what they want and they put back what, what they don't. And what Governor Wolf has done is created a much more comprehensive budget. Everything is contingent upon each other. So he didn't uh, present a, a budget, an education budget, without generating revenue. And there's two specific areas, well, three areas, um, in which he's trying to generate revenue, proposing. First is the natural gas um, tax, which is looking at putting, uh, presenting a fair tax to the natural gas industry to fund it. So that's, that's the first area. The two are a little more controversial, but, you know, I think they, they work themselves out. And one is um, a... a, a um, an income tax um, increase, and the second is a sales tax increase. So slight taxes in income and sales tax, which is going to generate the revenue, not only for the, for the education budget, but also for a reduction in real estate tax. So when you look at the governor's comprehensive plan, he understands a number of things. One, we have to invest in communities through education. Second, if we can invest by lowering property tax, uh, you know, creating incentives for folks to purchase house, homes and to invest in their community, it's going to create a, a much more comprehensive approach to community development. Wanna, do you have any intention, uh, in 2013 when there was, I believe, a $300 million or more budget deficit, a lot of things were cut. Sports um, and, and some other programs, including the Mentally Gifted Program, do you have any plans on reinstituting the Mentally Gifted Program in the Philadelphia School District? as it is in other districts and other parts of the Programmatically, the Department of Ed or the Governor's Office, we don't make programmatic decisions. So, so we provide the resources to make those decisions. But I will tell you, yes, across the state over the past few years, four years, major reductions have been made. It, it, all, most school districts across, I can't say all, most school districts across the Commonwealth. And that has been a result of the reductions that were made at the state level in terms of funding. And when you look at the governor's proposal, how he pulled those numbers, he looked specifically at the reductions that were made in 2009, 2010, tried to make up for some of those reductions. He took a look at the line items that were considered grants from last year's budget and took all of that and tied it into the basic education subsidy. So what the governor has looked to do to create this foundation, I didn't get specific because I didn't want to take a lot of time, but when you look at what he did, he took the reductions that were made, he tied in grant funds, and provided a really strong basic education funding formula that will create that foundation that will then put much of the funding back to school districts so that they no longer, not no longer have to make reductions to, to make ends meet, but they can start reinvesting in areas that, that are good for, for kids and programs that benefit students. So he's looking at providing the resources. That decision ultimately will, will be local decisions, not just for Philadelphia, for all school districts. My question is about the Keystone exams. Mm -hmm. I've testified for many years in opposition to them. They are, when they come into effect in 2017, they're going to be disastrous for a lot of worthy children in Philadelphia who are not going to be able to graduate because maybe they can't pass one exam by several questions. So my question is, I know you touched on this, can you be more specific about the plans for the Keystone exam requirement, I should say? Absolutely. 
So, so I can't get into specifics because we're still hammering that out and I don't want to jump the gun because quite often we have great plans and someone jumps the gun and all, now all of a sudden there isn't the will there to, to follow through. But what I will share with you, and I want to take a step back. First, I, I, I assure you, both the governor and, you know, and I are fully aware of the pain um, you know, and the suffering that Philadelphia has endured over the past few years. Um, I, I, you know, I'm in constant communication with Dr. Height, and even personally, I share from Philadelphia. And although I now live in Lancaster, my whole family is here. So anytime I, you know, my nephews, nieces, cousins all go, you know, to schools, you know, throughout the city, and um, so I hear it all the time. And one of the first things, you know, when I became secretary, well, two things. One, um, funding was the first conversation that came up at the, uh, you know, Thanksgiving. And then the second was, can I do anything about the lunch menus? But, um, so, so the first one, I said, I can advocate for funding. I can't do anything about the lunch menu. Um, but, so, so, so that's there. But I will tell you, we are looking at, um, we're looking at the Keystone requirements and finding ways to create multiple measures towards graduation so that there's not just one measure towards, gradu towards graduation. So um, different pathways. I'll give you an example, though this is just uh, to, to consider, we haven't agreed to this, but if a student is in a career and technical education program, for example, working towards a certificate, you know, that, should, that certificate should be given, or the, or the pathway to that certificate should be given consideration towards, towards graduation. So looking at many, many pathways towards success, identifying su success in high school. Now, I also want to be very honest. So it, Keystone may not be a sole measure for graduation, but I am a strong advocate for those standards. Because here's what happens when you don't have a, have a standard. Well, I shouldn't say here's what happens. I'm going to, take, I'm going to make, give the statement a more positive. Students who are learning algebra at, at Martin Luther King should be learning the same content as a student that's learning algebra in rapid. And, and that is the importance of, of having those, those standards in place. But I also understand the fact that we have to have multiple measures towards success. So if you're looking for watered down, I'm not going to do that. But if you're looking for multiple measures, that I will absolutely agree. He said he runs a, uh, a, a child care center, and it's a three star out of four child care center, and he wants to know if the governor has any more funding for that. For the Keystone Stars program. For the Keystone Stars program in the early childhood yes. centers. And are they going to find additional money for CSAS, which is the money that they provide for any certain children? So the CCIS state subsidy uh, increase is a, a conversation we're having. So, so that's definitely in the works, in the talks. There, there isn't a commitment towards that yet. But I will tell you what we're looking at in terms of fund the contingency. So this is where the Department of Ed and DHS work together. So the Department of Education, we've said every early childhood program we fund has to be aligned to strong kindergarten readiness standards. We, we don't just want to fund child care that doesn't align to preparing kids for school. So right now, the Keystone Stars is our measurement for, for ensuring that. So there is going to be a differentiation. I don't know what it is yet, because we're still uh, navigating that, our expectations. But there is going to be differentiation in terms of how we fund and support four, three star centers you know, and beyond. So being a three, a three star center is good. It will be recognized as good and be supported as an institution that's preparing kids for life in K-12 institutions. Teacher, a former teacher, yeah. right? A high school teacher said that the kids come out of homes where the problem might not be the child, it might be the parent. So what do you have in terms of adult education and for people who are coming out of prison? So adult education, workforce development, an umbrella plan for that. Part of the governor's proposal, and I don't hit on it a lot because we deal with the standards, but in working with labor and industry, there is a significant adult literacy investment, so hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in adult literacy. So, so that is, in, if you look at the governor's plan in 10 years, he wants to make sure that 650,000 Pennsylvania residents have a certificate, or two-year or a four-year degree. 
So that's really a significant investment as well in adult, in adult basic literacy, but also adult training programs. And you've been hearing, if you read the paper, you've been hearing the governor talk a lot about that, and we've been working behind the scenes to, to create a pathway towards doing that. So yes, that is going to be a significant investment. We're also working with, and I think you have Secretary um, Butzel here, but right. when he was here last week, right. and he's kind of sharing, so we've been working with his department as well to track from that, you know, prison back into the workforce, you know, pipeline. But, you know, he's actually, and he's really dynamic, he's a strong advocate and a dynamic guy because he's also really supporting the fact that if we invest in them earlier, you know, that pathway to, you know, to incarceration will, will be, uh, you know, will, 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 will be limited, will, will decrease, and so there's lots of connections being worked on. Okay. Is there more money for the Act 101 program, and is there money to support Cheney and Lincoln University? So Act 101, specifically in looking at the, oh, the package of uh, opportunity grants, uh, so not as part of the budget, but in part of working with FIA, there's a call to increase and I'm going to say 25 million, but don't quote me on the number, but there's a, a significant increase to the Keystone Opportunity Grant, so providing more grant and scholarship opportunities for, for students, for underrepresented students of, of need. So, so that is part of, not the budget proposal from PD, but that's part of the overall governor's proposal. And so that is a big conversation with FIA. Secondly, when you take a look at change specifically being in the, in the PASHI system, there's an increase I want to say 40 to 45 million dollars for, for the Pashi schools that will allow them through that allotment to uh, provide more funding to the to Pashi, the state system of higher education, the state schools. I'm not at the, so I sit on that board as well, and there are lots of conversations around how to support um, how, how to support Cheney in, in moving forward. So I can't change the stick, but that is a conversation. The other conversation around Lincoln, there's a there is a significant investment in the budget proposal for Lincoln as a state-related institution. So it's broken down by these qualifiers or identifiers, but there is an increase for each for all of them. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so the, the question is, how do we get more money for schools and less money for prisons? <laughs> Keep advocating. I mean, you know, understand one of the things that we have to do, the governor is, is taking on a huge load. I mean, he's taking on an aggressive approach, he wants to invest one billion dollars with the promise of another billion dollars in education. We can't let him carry this load alone. I mean, really, if you want to know what do you do, you, you continue to pick up the phone and hold our legislature accountable, you know, especially those who don't want to support, you know. Call you know, there's still folks out there that don't believe it's a good investment, and I can say it to anyone in this room. But, but the truth of the matter is, we have to continue to advocate, and um, nothing you shared would I stand here and disagree with. But we also understand that it's going to take a large movement um, to continue to support funding public education uh, equitably. And um, so keep picking up the phone, keep shooting the email, keep showing up to meetings and advocating on the end. The question is, can parents be part of the process of deciding what the graduation requirements are and if they should include the Keystone test? Is that the question? That, that is part of the question. We've got community groups and organizations in Philadelphia. That this is all we talk about. Okay. We talk about this on a regular basis. We want to be part of the decision. We know there needs to be an assessment. But an assessment that is unfair to English as a second language and some of the other students that have IEPs or should have IEPs. So, so wait a minute. I just, I just want to make sure we got it clear. So your question is, can these groups be part can of the process? Can he help foster? Can he help foster making the groups part? Okay, let's let him answer. What we have done lately, although I'll be honest, it has not been aggressive. So we, I mean, what we've aggressively been doing is bringing multiple stakeholders, and mostly district representatives from different districts, to the table to engage in that conversation. What we've not done, we've taken, we've taken that value in terms of our conversation that they've engaged with stakeholders, but what, so what I can do at the state level is have the conversations with the school districts that we're bringing to the table to have that discussion to involve multiple stakeholders. I mean, so I have to count on the school, I want to say it, it you know, more deliberate, I don't want to dance around your question. I have to count on the school districts to bring the stakeholder groups to the table to get this message across. Because if I try to connect 
with 500 school districts, um, you know, groups. I won't be. I won't be able to. I won't be able to do. I won't be able to do it. But what we can do is engage in a process that when the school districts come to the table, have them share out what they're connecting with their local, um, you know, stakeholders to do. So it's not something we can go ahead. No, no calling out. Just let them answer the question. Yes. We'll get to everybody that we can. I'm willing, I don't know what it would look like, but I'm willing to definitely have the conversation with the local school districts to think that's, uh, that's going to be done from the state level to help facilitate bringing uh, parents and other concerned community members into the schools to help. That's, that's the gist of it, right? The recommendations or the allowable uses of the increase in funds that we're proposing, that is one of the allowable uh, uses. What's, th what's interesting with the state, you know, to provide full transparency, we don't get into the specifics with school districts as to how you have to use your money. And as a matter of fact, what the governor is trying to do is remove all of those line items and put everything into basic ed so that school districts can make decisions that are in the best interest of their communities. So the answer to your question is yes, you can use the funding that way. But if you're asking me as the Secretary of Ed to mandate it, it's not how we allocate funding because when I'm looking at making this decision for 750 individual LEAs, I, we don't have, by law, I can't say Philadelphia, you have to use your funding this way. Schuylkill County, you have to use your funding this way. Blairstown, you have to use your funding this way. But what we can do and what we have done is said, you, is, we've said, this is good best practice, community schools. Uh, community, you know, uh, partnerships, community-based organization partnerships coming in, and that is an allowable use of funds. So we provided the, the pathway to do it, but what the, the Department of Ed couldn't do, you know, understand, I could sit here and say, yeah, it's a good way, and I'll tell them to use the money, but I want to be really honest with you, to say we, we allow it as a pathway, and it's definitely some, a way they can use the funding. There is no way, one, by law, and second, you know, even if we wanted to create law around it, to practically tell school districts how to spend their money. But they can use it. So there's two levels of uh, technical support that's being put in place. One is through OCTO, or the, our early childhood mm -hmm. department. Mm -hmm. So those who have put in the application, and let's say they're on the two to three cusp, they can request that technical support and they'll go in and, and help uh, you know, provide that, uh, the feedback to getting them to that next level. Mm -hmm. The second is we're looking at creating a pathway with um, intermediate units okay. to go in and provide that support. So it is something that we're looking at, especially with this, um, with the expansion, because we know if we're going to expand seats, we, we have to support providers to, to meet that demand. What is, is a huge part of, of not only this, the governor's proposal, but what we're pushing around the funding um, formula in general. And I, I'd be honest in saying we've not looked at, although we've started to look at specifically the disparity within uh, within the racial groups, but we have been very specific in looking at um, disparity within socioeconomics, within uh, you know condensed versus dispersed. So those are all factors we have specifically taken into account, and also looking at how do we provide support for the social emotional needs of kids, which isn't necessarily measurable, but knowing that there are communities out there that have needs that you can't measure, and how do you make up for some of that funding? So, you know, as we look at that equity, I'm pretty confident in just knowing the practice is going to address those other issues, but because of, but we're not stopping there, and it is something we can do. So he said, how can we afford to give a big tax decrease to corporations when our schools are still so far from adequate funding? But the governor has been really clear in what we've worked on. This is to establish that foundation for the basic ed formula. When you look at, um, especially around, cause you're, because you're right, in terms of that equity issue, there are school districts that have not been reduced at the same, you know, at the same rate. So when you're looking at what we're proposing, and, and this is going to be the big battle, what we're proposing as part of the basic education funding formula, we're going to continue to fill the gaps there. I mean, now, you know, obviously we'd love to have come out of the gate with a $2 billion, you know, increase, but what we look to do was bring us back to those, those nine and ten, nine, ten reduction numbers, which will then support the moving forward. It's not, it's a really aggressive budget, four years of, of, of significant reductions, you know, it is going to be hard to, to backfill around with the governor's taking
Well, let me, let me just say a couple of things. The first is that um, the conversation around cursive and script really wasn't about cursive and script, but more about the responses uh, that we were getting from the district, whether it be that question or any other question, we really felt like we were getting the runaround. And so, you know, you know, every year we do go to the, the same dance. You know, they come before us. Um, you know, Dr. Hyde, you know, I think he's a great person. I think his heart's in the right place. But whenever they sit down in front of us, it's kind of like, you know, they told us, oh, you know, everything's great. We've got a surplus this year. It's like $6.9 million. You know, we've got our financial house in order. You know, so just give us the money. Just give us the money that we're asking for. And so when you drill down and ask them additional questions, I can tell you that I feel very uncomfortable with some of the responses that we got and the accountability that we get out of the SRC in the district. And so, you know, they've got to do better. If we want parents to come out and be engaged, you know, they've got to step up their game as well because people want to see from them uh, better responses. We want to see as legislators that when they come downtown to City Hall, when they ask us, that they're actually partnering with us. Not just, you know, hand us over the money and we'll see you again next year. Right. We want accountability. We want them to step up and say that they're going to do a better job with what we give them. Yes. Because if we... I asked Dr. Hyde yesterday about, you know, the, the school full of books. You know, they had all these books in the basement. And so one of the statements they made was, we're going to spend our money um, or spend our resources boldly and purposefully. Well, what does that mean? Because you had a, a, a basement full of books. You had no idea they were there. You had no idea what materials were there. And so, you know, it doesn't feel as if the district has all of its ducks in a row. And so we want to do the right thing. We want to make sure they get the funding, but we want them to step up their game and do what they're supposed to do as well. There's a lot of work that needs to be done out in 440. Everybody here knows that. I'm not saying anything that we all don't know. But um, you know, we, you've got to do something better than what you're doing the same year in and year out when you come forward, ask us for funding, ask us for support. We give you the support you're looking for, but we don't get the accountability in return, and it's so important for our kids. So. I hope that answers your question. Well, let me, let me share some perspectives from Harrisburg. Um, but first, let me start locally. I went to Germantown High School. Right? Um, I, was a, I was a freshman legislator. In fact, you were also a freshman legislator when, when they closed Germantown. One of the most disrespectful things that you can do to a legislator is simply not have a conversation with them when you're doing something in yeah. their district. So Germantown High School closed down. All right, I'm sharing this story, and this is a true story. Germantown High School closed down. We tried to meet with Dr. Height. Well, we had phone conversations, I think, with Dr. Height's staff, but also with the mayor. The mayor would not come to Germantown to have a conversation with us. So a couple weeks later, the mayor's in Harrisburg, and he's meeting with the Philadelphia delegation, and he says, we need some money. It's the same story that yeah. they hear at city council. We need additional monies. And um, I said to the mayor, I said, you know, you closed my high school. And he said, we had to make tough decisions. And my response was, we make tough decisions every day. But you still should have at least had a conversation with us. And, and I'm bringing up that conversation because I think as I heard the audience talk, folks said they wanted to be at the table. Mm -hmm. So one of the aspects for Philadelphia, at least for, and I'll say locally for me, is that I want to make sure that whether it's the mayor, or the governor, or their representatives, that we at least have a conversation. I think one of the things that you might have seen since the councilman and I have been in office, and we try to do this jointly, is that we try to have open conversations and transparency. In fact, Solomon, I heard on your radio station this morning, you had Alan Buckowitz there, and you were talking about doing an audit for the school district, yes. and we have the same thing also. Every single year, in fact, they're asking, I think, for additional dollars, yeah. this, this go round, and the governor has, has, has a, well, has, proposed some additional dollars. But again, it still has to, we still have to have that conversation with the House and the Senate. But the, the overall problem is this. Folks see that Philadelphia has a need. We're the, we're the, the Class A city. Uh, we're the largest city in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But when we have 67 counties and they keep seeing Philadelphia legislators, uh, you know, mayor come up there and, and council president and others, Dr. Hyde, come up there, um, they want to know what they're getting for their, their investment. Again, there's 67 counties. 
when you look at Philadelphia, we only have 20, 23 maybe legislators from the city of Philadelphia out of 253. So we really need to make sure that when, be it Dr. Hyde, be it the mayor, that there's some accountability as to how the dollars are being spent. Folks don't want to just simply divvy out dollars. Now, I applaud this governor because this governor, at least since I've been there, and I've only been there for 29 months, but this governor has actually stepped up to the plate and said, I want to invest more dollars. Well, we had the other governor where we were back and forth between the Republicans and the Democrats, even though this is an educational issue, it doesn't matter if you're a Dean or R, but the reality of it was is that folks tend to follow the leadership and you know the, the, the Republicans are in the majority, so most of them tend to follow their majority lead. We're in the minority, so you'll see that most of the Philadelphia representatives are pushing for additional dollars. But the bottom line is that, and I think, Eric, you hit it, it, it has to be a groundswell. You know, I mean, you have to really be relentless in regards to not closing schools. You have to be relentless in regards to picking up the phone, calling whoever you need to call. But if you're not relentless in that, then what happens is that we we'll simply go into our caucus, we have a brief conversation, we got on the House floor, and then we just see, simply see how folks vote. And then there's no repercussion based on how you vote. But then we just wait till the next year to come around. So I just want to say that it starts really with a groundswell. I applaud you folks that are here today because this is where it really starts at. You know, we go back up to Harrisburg next week. The whole month of June is a budget conversation. It's a negotiation, right? So just make sure that you guys do what you need to do. Make the phone calls to help us. So that way, at the end of the day, we have a budget that, that really funds our education system. But one other sure. thing, too, is that the other piece of this is that this audience should be full. Like, you know, this room should be full. This is the number one issue in the city of Philadelphia today. And it says something that this room isn't full. And I just spoke to someone just this weekend, very disappointing, that, you know, another family that I know is moving out of the city, moving right up to Lafayette Hill. You know, and, and how many families are we losing? We're losing a lot. Don't underestimate it. So, you know, it's just very daunting to, you know, okay. that, that we don't have the audience that we should have for the secretary. Okay. Go ahead, Senator. Senator, Senator, Senator Haywood, go so ahead. This is going to be even more brief. Uh, this is some uh, math. So there's 50 senators in the Senate. 30 are Republican, 20 are Democrats. 30, 20 in the Senate. Five are Philadelphia, 45 not Philadelphia. So in order to get any movement in the Senate, we have to persuade Republicans to go our way. We have to persuade Republicans to go our way. We will give you, we have the list of Republicans who we think might go our way. Most of them, they're either in Delaware County, Chester County, Montgomery County, Bus County, here in southeastern Pennsylvania. So if you contact uh, Eric Hodge, raise your hand. Eric is an intern on my staff. If you have relationships in those counties, uh, we're organizing people to reach those senators to get them to go our way. That's what I think we've got to do. All right. Um, I'm finding so many different mentalities today. It seems hard. It seems hard. It seems, it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard, hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, walk on. everything else, else is a challenge. Is a challenge. challenge. Um, so, 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 I'm ready for I'm this ready challenge. For this challenge. And, I was, and I was built for this.